we live in a world that is in total confusion. Take, for example, in the morning, you turn on the news, you hear recently of someone inadvertently getting shot on a movie set. You turn to the next station, you hear of a, a mass shooting, and it breaks your heart, and you wonder what is going on. You turn the station again, and you hear about a natural disaster. You keep turning the station looking for something better, but you're just not going to find it. And just when you get that little bright glimmer of hope, it's always followed by a breaking news report. That's the world we live in. And if you're attending the meetings with us right now as Jehovah's Witnesses, you've noticed something right when this meeting started. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of smiles, a lot of how you doing, nice to see you. Why? How is it that two groups of people can look at the same scenario in this world and look at it and act differently. You know, out of the United States population, we have 332 million people approximately in the U.S., but only 3 million, a little over 3 million, actually watch the news. In fact, the younger generation, they shy away from the news. A lot of social media, but any bad news, they kind of shy away from. And this is why. I'm going to give you two statements of a 22-year-old and a 17-year-old. The 22-year-old said this, life is all about luck. They believe in that, bad and good luck. They said, you can work hard, have a good education, eat well, and you may have a good life if the dice go in your favor. But on the other hand, you could do the exact same thing and have the worst luck possible. That's in the words of the younger generation. A 17-year-old said this about work. You can have a good education, but the world is full with a dog-eat-dog -dog society. Me first. And you know what they ended with? I'm sick of it. The world we live in is in total disarray. If you look into the scriptures, this is something we as Jehovah's Witnesses know. When we look at the world, we have a positive view of what we're seeing. Not because we enjoy it, but because we know what's coming after it. Second Timothy chapter three and verse two. Would you mind turning there with me? These are the things we are faced with and we understand why people feel the way they do. Why they're depressed. Mental health is a big issue. Why? What does second Timothy chapter three verse two say? This is what Jehovah God, the creator, said we would face in these last days. Verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, disloyal. If you keep going down in the verse, it goes on and on. This is the world we live in. So you can understand why people are doing one thing. They have this philosophy. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, so I'm going to live my life today to the fullest. You've heard that. Live tomorrow because tomorrow you will die. It's because what they see seems like it has no end. Isaiah chapter 33, sorry, verse tw chapter 22. Let's go there. Isaiah 22, verse 13. They have adopted this mentality. This is a satanic mentality that they don't even realize that they've adopted. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13, because of everything they see and because they feel they have no hope, look at how they lead their lives. Isaiah 22 and verse 13. But instead, there is celebration, rejoicing, the killing of cattle, the slaughtering of sheep, the eating of meat, the drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we will die. They're trying to get everything they can out of this life because they feel, as many do, they have no tomorrow. Or when tomorrow comes, when my day comes and I am die, I am dead, that is it. Now, that is a sad mentality when you think about that. You live your whole life just thinking I'm going to die, so I have to get everything I can out of these 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years because that's it. Why is it that they have this mentality? But when you look at Jehovah's Witnesses and you ask us about the future, oh, we can write a book. We just start talking about all the things we are looking forward to doing, and they wonder, what are you looking forward to? We have a bright future because we put our trust in Jehovah. And what Jehovah has done, he has on his calendar, he has circled a date. 
And he has made a single promise to each and every one of us, to all humans on this earth. If we choose to accept it, we can have a future in which everything we see now, all the negative things, what did 2 Timothy 3 verse 2 says, the lovers of money, hearty blasphemy, disobedience, all these things we're seeing, turn to the news, they will be gone. That is a promise that Jehovah makes to you and I. And Jehovah's Witnesses, we believe it. That's why we can look at a mass shooting and be broken in heart, but yet know in our mind something better is coming. That's why we can endure sickness because we still get sick. We can endure pain because we still hurt. That's why we can still see our bodies go downward in a spiral. We can deal with injustice. We can deal with hatred. We can even deal with a death coming at us because of an illness. Why can we deal with all these things and have such a positive view? Jehovah. His name means he causes to become. And the future he promises for you and I is beautiful. So during this talk, we're going to talk about something that you need in order to have that bright prospect for the future. If you want to look at the future with courage, positivity, with excitement, eagerness, you need one thing. Would you mind looking at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1? Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Notice the very first word in verse 1. Faith. What we are about to explain in verse 1 is the definition of faith. You see, many people say, well, faith is this two fingers coming together as one, and you're hoping for something. No, that's not what Jehovah says. The Bible, the faith that we have as witnesses is defined this way. Look at verse 1. Faith is the assured expectation of what is hoped for, the evident demonstration of of realities that are not seen. So you may say, well, as witnesses, you just told me you have it not seen. You have not seen these realities. So what are you basing your faith on? Well, look at it again. It says the evident demonstration of these things we have not seen, or as the footnote, the convincing evidence. So when you think about it, look at it this way. You may not be able to see something, but believe it's there. We have not seen the future promises that Jehovah has outlined for us, but we know, like it says, we are assured it will happen. Why? Because of the convincing evidence. It's like anything else you can't see. If I was to take a raw egg, tell you to come stand before me, put it above your head. I say, I'm going to drop this egg. I'm going to let it go. And let's just see if gravity works. It's foolish because it's been tried over and over again. We know that what goes up always comes down. Gravity is there. Or a farmer, he takes a seed, he drops it in the ground, corn grows. He takes a seed again, drops it in the ground, corn grows. If he takes it a third time and wishes for apples, it just doesn't happen. The Bible gives us all those convincing pieces of evidence. When you look at verse 1 again, it says it's based on a demonstration. Jehovah has not just made promises, but he's demonstrated Time and time again, he's given us, as the footnote says, convincing evidence that his promises will come true. So we encourage you, study the Bible. Sit with Jehovah's Witnesses. Have a study with them. Let us show you all the things Jehovah has promised. Let us show you the prophecies he's already fulfilled to give you even more confidence, faith, that the things we have not seen are assured. Someone summed it up very nicely when it comes to having faith in Jehovah. If you don't mind turning in your Bible to Joshua, let's go to Joshua 23, and we're going to read verse 14. Joshua 23 and verse 14. Now, he was a man. He served Jehovah, loved him with all his heart. Near the end of his life, he is recounting all the things Jehovah has done. And notice how he views Jehovah. Look at his faith. Hear his words and see if he did not have convincing evidence. Joshua 23 and verse 14. 
Now look, I'm about to die and you well know with all your heart and with all your soul that not one word out of all the good promises that Jehovah your God has spoken to you has failed. They have all come true for you. Not one word of them has failed. That was Joshua at the end of his life. He didn't say Jehovah gave me many good things and the majority of the things he said come, came true. No, he said not one of them has failed. And he believed it with his heart to the deepest part of who he was. That was his faith. And that's the faith we have when it comes to Jehovah's promises. We know what Jehovah has said in the Bible, and we can show you prophecy after prophecy. We can show you all the things he has foretold that, had control, that came true to give you even more faith in the promises for the future. And we don't have a lot of time for that. But if you want to learn more about that, take a Bible study with one of us. And we can show you. But for now, let's do this. Let's just take four examples of things Jehovah has promised and the convincing evidence he's given us that those things will come true. Let's look at the very first thing in Psalm 46. Let's look at Psalm 46 and verse 9. And what you're going to learn here in the meeting, what you're going to enjoy is we're going to use the Bible to establish what our faith is. This is not going to be a human talking, but it's going to be God's word talking. So here's a single promise Jehovah's given us. The first one, the end of war. Psalm 46 and verse 9. Notice what Jehovah says here, the promise he makes. Psalm 46, 9. He is bringing an end to wars throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the military wagons with fire. Jehovah says he will bring it into war. And you think to yourself, well, what's the proof? How do we know he can do this? Well, we as witnesses know he's the almighty. He's all powerful. But think about something here. It says he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. You think about bow and spears. You start to think about Bible accounts. There is one that pretty much everyone knows, whether you have served Jehovah or not. It's about the Israelites. Remember that Red Sea? In history, that Bible account, the Israelites are going through the Red Sea. The Egyptians are following them. What happened to the Egyptians? These men of war with their spears, their chariots, what happened to them? Jehovah destroyed them. He just added water, and that was it. Jehovah says, I will end wars. So when we read about innocent ones dying in wars, bombs, missiles, whether it be gang-related or military-related, all these things will be gone, and Jehovah has given us already just one example that he can do that. And the Bible is full of them. So wars, a promise we look forward to, peace from that. Let's look at a second one that Jehovah promises to rid. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 24. We're going to talk about being sick of being sick. Isaiah 33 and verse 24. Here at Jehovah put in his word the Bible, and no resident will say, I am sick. That is a promise he has made. And what proof do we have that Jehovah will eradicate? What proof do we have that man can't solve an answer to this illness, but Jehovah can? Well, think about the greatest person who ever lived on this earth. Jesus Christ. When he came to the earth, what did he do? He preached about God's kingdom. He told the beautiful qualities of his father, and he gave them an evident demonstration. He gave them convincing evidence of Jehovah's power by healing the blind, the lame, the maimed, the sick, the deaf. Jesus did these things, but how did he do it? It was Jehovah's power. Jehovah gave him the ability to give us a glimpse of what he's going to be able to do in the future on a grander scale, a worldwide scale. So when Jehovah says no resident, no resident will say, I am sick. That promise, we have convincing proof of it. And the Bible is full of more. And if you want to know more, and we're going to keep saying it, accept that Bible study. But let's go to the third point. 
Here is something in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, that we as witnesses, we look forward to. A promise Jehovah makes to us. Revelation chapter 17, sorry, chapter 7 and verse 14. This is our salvation here. In Revelation 7, 14, before we read this, just think about this as witnesses. We know a day is going to come. The world hates us as witnesses already. But we know in the near future, the entire world will come against us as God's people and want to eradicate us. They've been saying it for centuries. But there will come a time, pivotal, where they will come against us to try to rid us. But Jehovah says, this is a promise to you. Revelation 7, verse 14. So right away I said to him, my Lord, you are the one who knows. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Can you imagine? These are the ones who are these are the ones. That's you. That's me. Jehovah promises that when the devil comes against us with his worldly forces, they will not be able to eradicate Jehovah's people. Jehovah says, we will survive that great tribulation. But what proof do we have of that? How do we know that he has a saving power? Well, we talked about the Red Sea. That was one example. I'm going to give you a second one. There's an account in the Bible with a prophet named Elisha. If you get a chance to look at it, there was a nation coming against Elisha and the Israelites, Syrian army. He woke up that morning, he looked outside, and you saw nothing but chariots and horses and military might coming against him to destroy them. Elisha said a prayer. His attendant asked him, what are we going to do? Elisha opened his eyes and looked up, and you know what he saw? Well, when you read it, you'll see that there was myriads of angels there that Jehovah allowed him to see that were coming to his aid to fight for him. Yes, when Jehovah says these are the ones who will come out of the great tribulation, when Jehovah says you and I will be saved, when the world thinks Armageddon is the whole world being destroyed and every last bit of humanity gone, we know one thing is true. Those serving Jehovah will survive his day. When that date on his calendar comes, he will be our savior. That is a promise. And we have seen him do that time and time again in the scriptures. And then here's a fourth promise. Even if, even if we don't make it before the end of this system and we die, whether it be of natural causes or of something unforeseen, Jehovah promises a resurrection. That promise in itself is enough to keep us looking at the future with courage. This is what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. If you don't mind, turn to there, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. When we think of losing loved ones, our own lives being lost, I like what it says. Moreover, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who are sleeping in death. So Jehovah views it as momentary, sleeping. But notice this. So that you may not sorrow as the rest do who have no hope. Jehovah says he is going to resurrect millions upon millions of people soon to perfect human lives, beautiful bodies, to a paradisaic earth. So when we lose someone in death, it hurts us and it hurts Jehovah. It hurts the angels looking down. But we don't sorrow as the rest do who have no hope. Our tears are not followed with, I will never see my mother again. My tears aren't followed by, that was the last thing I have of them. Now all I have is memories. No. Our tears are followed by what? Faith. It's followed by the understanding that I'm going to see that smile. I'm going to hear that laughter. I'm going to have that meal with them. We don't sorrow as the rest do. Because Jehovah made a promise that he is going to resurrect these millions and millions. So when we think about death, we don't like it. We don't look forward to it. And we hope it never happens. But if it does, that resurrection hope is what gives us that courage to keep going every single day with a positivity. 
These are just four promises Jehovah has given us. And when we think about this one, not sorry as the rest do, I think, well, what evidence have we ever seen of someone coming back to life, to a body again? Well, look at the greatest man who ever lived again, Jesus Christ. When he came to the earth, did he not resurrect Lazarus after being dead for days? He did that on earth as a human of Jehovah's power. Now he is the king in heaven with all the power and authority Jehovah's given him on a grand scale. He's going to open all those tombs and bring back to beautiful bodies, beautiful life, millions. That is our convincing evidence. So when we say we look forward to the resurrection, it's not a hope. We have convincing evidence. It is assured in our minds. Brothers, when we look at these things, what do we do with them? Do I take my joy and hold it to myself? No. We go and we preach. So if you wonder why Jehovah's Witnesses are always sending you those letters during this pandemic, we use more stamps than anyone at this point. Why are you getting these letters over and over again before the pandemic? Why were they always coming to my neighborhood, knocking on doors? Because we love you. We want you to look at the world situation and have the same positive view that we have, that this is temporary. So we preach, and we understand it is a daunting task. So brothers and sisters, when we go into ministry, when we write those letters, take that faith, that strong faith we have, and let it go into your word choice of the letters. Let it go into your voice as you smile and talk to the person that you have never met. There are 7.8 billion people roughly on this earth. Do you know how many witnesses are on this earth preaching? about 8.5. That means roughly you have a little over 900 people. Each one of us have over 900 people we need to reach with this good message, with good news. And think about another aspect of good news that the world needs to hear, something that they really, really want every four years or every two years. Look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. We're going to add this as a Another promise of Jehovah's that we're going to talk about. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. It's about God's kingdom, his government. Daniel 2, 44. Jehovah says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be passed on to any other people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and it alone will stand forever. Take that to the ones in the ministry. Do you know how many times you see in the news or hear people say in the markets or as you're doing your errands, hear people become frustrated at, we thought we had this dream of a man who took lead in the government, and now we have a nightmare. They're frustrated thinking, well, four years from now, I can make a change. Two years from now, I can, I can get somebody better in office. Look at the promise that Jehovah's given us. Jehovah says, I have a kingdom that is going to get rid of all those shaky governments. The changing of guards, the changing of authority, two years for you, four years for you, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Jehovah says, you don't have to worry about that anymore. If you put faith in me, you dedicate and follow me as your God, Jehovah, then I have a government that has one leader. That is not going to give that authority to anyone else. Jehovah's gave him all authority. And that is Jesus. And he is righteous. He is just. He's loving. He's balanced. He's got all those qualities you're looking for. When we preach, preach the kingdom. Jesus said we have to preach that kingdom to the ends of the earth because that is what is going to bring about that beautiful new world. So, brothers, let them know about God's kingdom. And don't do it in a solemn voice when we talk to them on the phone, when we write out letters, this is how you want to preach. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 145. Let's look at that. Psalm 145, and we're going to look at verse 7 and verse 11. Psalm 145. Think about this as you're preaching. This is how you want to go about your ministry. Verse 7. Bubble over as you recall 
the abundant goodness. Who's abundant goodness? Jehovah's. Think about all the good things you have experienced from Jehovah in your life. And when you think about it, you start making that list, you get excited, you can't stop talking about Jehovah. Bubble over when you preach to people on the phone. Be enthusiastic. Verse 7 says, shout out joyfully. You may not want to shout on the phone, but let them know how positive this message is. All they have is bad news day in and day out. We have good news. Put a smile on their face and give them this message. Verse 11, proclaim and speak about Jehovah's glory and mightiness. Brothers, we have this beautiful responsibility to preach. Let's take it up earnestly with zeal. As Joshua said, with our whole heart, our whole soul. Help this world to face the future with courage as we do. It's a heavy responsibility, but it's one that Jehovah has entrusted to humans, to us. As you're sitting here today and you're listening to this talk and you've seen the different faces on the monitors and you see all the smiles, if you want a piece of that, accept the study with one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Come to our meetings regularly. If you need help in trying to find someone to study with you, talk to someone after the meeting and they can get you the information and get you on that road to life. Having you have that same positive aspect that we have when it comes to the future. And for our dear brothers and sisters who are sitting here listening to this talk and we don't know what you're going through internally or externally, this last scripture is a promise that Jehovah makes that is dear to all of us. If you don't mind looking at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, and we're going to read verse 6. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Jehovah says in verse 6, be courageous and strong. Do not be afraid or struck with terror before them, for Jehovah, your God, is the one marching with you. He will neither desert you nor abandon you. Whether you're new in the truth and you have all this vitality or you're older in years and you may have a little cane or a walker, Jehovah says it doesn't make a difference. Continue in your strength. Continue to make sure your faith is strong. Because Jehovah says, I am where? Not behind you. I'm right there in front of you. I'm leading you. Jehovah is leading us as a people through this system. He is helping us to navigate mental health problems, depression, illness, and Jehovah says one thing, he won't abandon us ever to eternity. That is the most reassuring feeling that we as witnesses have, that my God is the closest thing to me. If you want to feel that same love, come to know Jehovah. Let Jehovah navigate you with us through this system. Look at the future with bright hope and enthusiasm because Jehovah is waiting to that date on the calendar comes to fruition and he will unload upon us blessings upon blessings upon blessings to eternity and we want you to be there so when we look at the world scene today we don't worry we look to the future with two things courage and faith <laughs>